So let's get started. <laughs> Our next speaker is Justin Aizov, and he's been a long time Zeek developer, which means a whole three hours. <laughs> and For since the beginning. And also a long time Bro developer for way longer than I can remember. And we will take a look at what is cooking in his uh, Justin's Bro laboratory. Laboratory. Yeah, Lizikatory doesn't, doesn't work as good. Uh, so, all right, so quick quiz at the start. Does anyone know this is a graph of CPU on a Bro manager? Does anyone know what's going on? Does anyone know what that is, what's causing that? Nope, no restarts. Log rotating, yes. First thing I'm going to talk about is uh, Bro atomic log rotation. So how exactly does Bro rotate logs? The gist of it is it first moves the log file to a temporary file name with some timestamp information, and then it gzips it to its final location. This can be problematic for a lot of reasons. Often it just doesn't finish for whatever reason. Another problem could be maybe it was going to finish, but you tried reading it before it was done. Now you have a unexpected EOF on your gzip file because there's really no way to tell just by looking at it, is it even done? So, and the thing that this is a problem is because it's not an atomic operation. So depending how much you know about Unixy things, if you do a move on the same file system, that's atomic. It's either the first name or the new name. You're not going to ever see it as both or incomplete. However, many operations are not atomic. A copy, a move across the file system, downloading a file. Who downloads files directly to Bro Intel? Yeah, you're, you're breaking things. Don't do that. Uh, and gzipping an input to an output. So the solution is pretty straightforward. Anytime you need to move across the file system, copy it to a temporary file, move the temporary file to the final file, and then finally delete the original file. Uh, if you use move, it kind of does this, but it doesn't do the temp file name, so you end up with that same situation where you have both the source and the destination file, which is not helpful. And when you're compressing, you compress to a temp file name, move that to the final name, and then delete the source. So pretty straightforward, just do things slightly differently. There's another problem in the way Brewer rotates logs is it doesn't actually do this. It does all of them at once, which is why you get that gigantic log spike uh, CPU every hour, because Bro isn't just rotating your con log, it's rotating your con log, your DNS log, your HTTP log all at once. So you get you know, 30 gzip processes all competing for CPU. And even with niceness, it's still not great for your CPU cache to be spending all of your cores trying to do gzip. So uh, the solution to fix that is don't compress it, just move to a temporary directory, and then in an external tool for each file in that directory, compress it. And the end result is that your gigantic log spikes every hour turn into a longer but much less load on the system. And if you did still want logs to rotate faster, you could use pigs or pbzip2 or any of the other parallel compressors. And this is really easy to get going. You could install this now. You don't even need to restart your bro cluster. You just drop the scripts in place, and your CPU every hour will go down by a lot. So that's atomic log rotation. Um, I'll zip through. We can do questions at the end. I have the thing. I have no idea if that works, so you'll have to find out with me. Uh, the next thing. Uh, it's really exciting. It's my favorite feature that's going to be in 2.6. Uh, John Seawick actually did most of the work making this work. I just pestered him about it for a couple of months. So currently, to get data from the worker to the manager, like the stuff Seth was talking about with the DHCP analyzer, you need to do two things. You need to first tell Bro what events on the worker should go to the manager, and then raise the event. And then there's this magic thing that happens which goes, oh, OK, you told me you wanted this event to go to the manager, and it happens. And on a little script like this, it looks OK. On a larger script, it can be really confusing because there's nothing inherent in that event line that necessarily indicates that that's what's happening. Um, so you could use this to implement a little like scan detector. So for every new connection, raise my event. And on the manager side, first check that you're on the manager. And then for each 
uh, connection from that source, do a little incrementing and raise a notice. Like, not how this would actually work, but not, it's not too far off from uh, how like, an actual scan detector script works. And the downsides of that, you have all your workers pushing everything to the manager. It puts a lot of load on the manager. The manager becomes a single point of failure. Uh, and it doesn't scale, uses all the memory, potentially maxes out a CPU core. There's lots of reasons why you don't want this. And kind of this is what it would look like on the wire is all of your workers sending to the manager different events for different IP addresses and just centralizing the data. And the end result is that the single manager process would have to see all six of those events and this is kind of the data structure you'd end up with, just putting all the data in one place. But with 2.6, there's a new function called cluster publish HRW, which looks scary, but just stands for highest random weight. And one simplified way of looking at this is say, instead of sending all the IP addresses to one node, send all the even IP addresses to one and all the odd IP addresses to the other. And since you're counting by IP address, that will work fine. Uh, each node will count the odds and the other one will count the evens and everything gets along well. So the way publish HRW works is you tell it the nodes you want to distribute across. You, the second argument is the thing you want to hash on. In this case, we want to keep all the sources together. And then you raise your my event source like we were doing before. And uh, the, on the proxy side that's now gonna be aggregating these, it's the same code except we don't need to guard it. You saw here we had to do, if we're running on the manager, track this, otherwise you'd end up counting it twice. With this new setup, you don't need to do that because it's only going to go because here we explicitly told it, send this to the proxy. It's not implicitly figured out by the communication framework. Um, this is kind of what it looks like behind the scenes. Instead of all the workers sending to the manager, now all the workers will decide. Really cool, if you could envision just data moving between these. I have no animation skills, so I didn't do it, but you know, kind of envision different one IP address going to proxy one, another IP address going to proxy two, and aggregating by the like IP addresses. And kind of on the wire, this is what you'd see. So we have dot one would go to proxy one, dot two would go to proxy two, dot one again would also go to proxy one. So just consistently distributing these to the proxies. And the end result is that instead of the manager seeing six events and all the IP addresses, now we have one proxy sees three events, and the other proxy also sees three and they each only have to look at half the data. Um, and I can show a quick demo of that if I did not get logged out. So let's, I'll zoom in a second. So, oh, one really cool thing that works amazingly in 2.6 is Broker Control had a print command. So similar to the things you can see in the like uh, config log, you could print say site local nets on the manager and it will print it out. Uh, where this is useful, if you had a table, let's say, scan attacks, which is what my simple scan implementation uses for tracking scans, and you wanted to see what it's doing, you print it, and now I have you know, tens of thousands of data structures, and if I zoom in, you kind of see each one is just a source IP address and the uh, tracked scan data that I'm keeping track of. And each one of these, say, will have a first scene so if I print that out and grep for the counts of first scene, on proxy one, I have 10,500 tracked, and on proxy two, I have 10,400 tracked. So almost perfect distribution of the load across the two proxies. So uh, this should enable a bro to scale out a lot more than it does. And one thing that might not work until something like 2.7 would be clusters with no single point of failure. So it even works now, you can kill one of those proxies and all the workers will then send to the remaining living proxy. So if you currently do things like run proxies distributed across your worker nodes, right now if one of your worker nodes goes down, your cluster kind of stops working because half of the nodes don't have a working proxy and nothing worked right. Now it will just continue working. It'll just redistribute the data to the working proxies and you won't miss uh, detection, which is pretty cool. All right, how am I doing for time? Good. All right, next thing uh, is the Bro Zero MQ Writer. I actually had very little to do with this other than requesting features. Daniel Thayer actually wrote the entire thing. Um, 
it's really cool. So on the bro side, you add a couple lines saying what you want to send where, and there's a lot of options very similar to like the Kafka writer. So if you only want to send con or only want to send DNS, you can do all that sort of things. And then in this is some Python code that uses zero MQ. So this is an entire program that receives a stream of logs from bro. This is the entire thing. And the really cool thing about zero MQ is while we have bindings for Python and C++ for broker, we don't have, say, Lua bindings or Ruby bindings or Pro bindings. Zero MQ has bindings for every programming language. So if you're a Ruby programmer and really want to use some Ruby-only library to analyze bro logs in real time, you need maybe four lines of code to connect and subscribe, and you will get a stream. And I have a demo prepared if things will be nice and work. So I have a script to get started, which is just the two lines uh, that I showed, and then a handful of other lines just to turn off default logging so I don't write to my disk for the purpose of this demo. So we start up bro. Oh, and it'll also just output new connections so we can see that it's working. So this should start up and get a lot of connections on the wireless. And if I run that receive python receive.py, uh, let me show you that first. It's basically what I showed. It's zoom in here. A couple lines of code to just connect, make a subsocket, bind. If I have any topics, subscribe to them. Otherwise, subscribe to all of them, and then just receive and print. So basically, Python and zero MQ 101. Nothing really specific to anything. And if things are going to be nice to me, if I run this, it will start outputting the logs to my screen. So uh, kind of a stupid demo. I was thinking before, could I come up with something better before my talk? So there's another cool database called PipelineDB. So I have a start database here. So let's start this up. And I kind of worked off that example to prototype a log writer for Bro that writes to PipelineDB using JSON binary columns. So basically, the only code that's different from the previous example is that. So just uh, first create a stream if it doesn't already exist, and then just do inserts. And the cool thing about this is Bro kind of has a Postgres writer, but prototyping it would be a lot harder. Where this, you can just restart the Python script until you get it right, instead of having to recompile it, load it into Bro, restart Bro. Uh, so yeah, I don't even have to stop Bro. I can just run this new writer, and it should. It was actually queuing in Bro while I was figuring out how to start this. So I could actually kill this. It'll buffer in Bro, and then if I restart it, it'll pick up where it left off. So really easy for prototyping. And then I should have some example. In this file, I wrote just kind of the simplest example I could think of. Let's look at all the DNS queries coming in and do a two reports of top DNS queries and top DNS sources. And a neat thing that PipelineDB does is when you do count distinct, it's actually using hyperloglog. So very similar to the features in Bro for doing large amounts of data. Pipeline, pipeline. So if I load that SQL file, that's fine. And then select star from top. DNS, order by C descending, limit 10. So here is a real-time query showing the top DNS that Bro on my laptop is seeing. And this would work the same on a large cluster with a ton, amount, uh, a ton of data. And the other report I did was top DNS clients. So, and this updates, you could see, Pipeline DB is crazy fast. It's kind of similar to like Kafka, SQL streaming, and things like that. And I put this together in about 20 minutes. So it might not necessarily be production ready, but for trying out new ideas and playing with new things, the Zero MQ writer is pretty much the perfect thing to use. Probably any idea that you have, you could whip something up pretty fast and uh, build a proof of concept in no time at all. Plus the fact that it works in every single programming language. Oh, so we're gonna forget, it doesn't always work and I don't think it's my fault. But Google has their safe browsing API client. And I wrote up, I basically modified 
modified their example. This was almost all code that they wrote, but I added some 0MQ sockets and then decoded either the HTTP or TLS log and then just called the function. So their program kind of wanted it from the command line. I just made it subscribe to the log feed. And in theory, if you run it, it likes to download a gigantic database and oop, kill that. So, so now in theory, say if I curl the uh, say never ssl.com, we'll get that it just searched the Google Safe Browsing API for never ssl.com. And this was also something I put together in about 20 minutes. Really, the one downside is since that it's not using broker, if you did use this to detect a malicious URL, there's no super easy way to get it back into Bro. Uh, so rewriting this to use broker would really be the thing to do. But this is a good example because there are no broker bindings for Go that are super easy to use. You'd have to probably kind of do it yourself using CGO, which would not be fun at all. But this is just a great example. There was an existing code base in Go that did safe browsing lookups, and I wanted to feed bro logs into it. So using the 0MQ output, it was a piece of cake to put those two things together. All right, so that's that. And it's on GitHub. You can install it now. It should work on 2.5. I think I'm running it on 2.6. It might even work on 2.4 if for some reason you're still running that. All right, uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about, which it's kind of a downer, is lib flow bypass. I don't have too many slides for it, but there's this really cool thing in Linux now called eBPF and XDP. Uh, you may be familiar with BPF, if I can remember how to do it, one second here, code, uh, dash D. So when you do something like TCP dump port 80, it actually generates this bytecode that it can potentially run in the kernel. And it looks confusing, but if you did say host 8.8.8.8, you'll see in here somewhere, here's our 8.8.8.8 that's either looking at source or destination. And if you only did source, it would appear once or twice. So this is actually a little VM that runs in the kernel, so you don't have to receive the packet just to ignore it. What they've done recently is extended this, which I think the E is either enhanced or extended. So now there's things like data structures. Once you have a data structure, now you can start keeping track of flows in the kernel and seeing, is this flow in my data structure? And if it is, drop it, otherwise pass it along. So if I'm lucky, I have this running on a box. I should be able to get working. Uh, all right. Uh, did we reboot? Let's try. Uh, oh. There we go. You do need to mount stuff, which is annoying because nothing sets it up. Ooh. Oh, I might not be able to demo this, but that's okay. Ah, well, some packaging system updated my system from kernel 4.17 to 3.10, which is not quite an upgrade. Um, which, so yeah, can't demo that, but it's, it doesn't look like much anyway. But the gist of it is, so is anyone using Dumno with the Arista switches? So if you happen to have an Arista switch, you can do flow shunting at 100 gig speeds. It works great. Problem is you need an Arista switch. If you don't have one or you need to filter many, many, many flows, you can't necessarily use the Arista to filter, say, every Netflix SSL connection. However, using the eBPF features in the kernel, you can load a program that looks at a map and says, is this five tuple in the map? And if it is, drop the packet. Uh, I could probably bring up the code for that. It's fairly straightforward. If I can find my browser. Uh, lib, come on. I'll just Google it. Lib flow bypass. OK. Or not, because my keyboard doesn't work. Well, that doesn't work. Wow, I'm not having a good day. But let me see. Oh, you know what? Uh, where did I go? 
it's OK because I have the code right here. So what you do is you have to write a kernel module, which is kind of crazy, but it gets compiled down. So you end up with a, oops, it's in a header file, xdp maps. There we go. So you define a pretty simple data structure of uh, source IP address, dest IP address, the ports and the protocol, and we you want to track the time, the packets, and the bytes. And then inside the kernel, you have a table. And it's pretty much, if you did in Bro, a table of source port source, or a table of adder port, adder port of count, it's basically the same thing. So you just have this gigantic hash running in the kernel, mapping five tuple to some extra data. And you have to do all this code to decode the packet, but once you do that, it boils down to this. After all the code that has nothing to do with the task at hand, you end up with a handful of lines. You say, take my tuple, look it up in my table. If it exists in the table, uh, increment the last seen time, the packets, and the bytes, and drop it. Otherwise, pass it. And it's not terribly complicated. The benefit is this is running in the kernel super, super early. So this will run at 40 gig line rate. You could do uh, shunting in the kernel at line rate uh, with commodity Intel like 10 or 40 gig cards, which is great. Uh, the one thing that I discovered, which is a limitation, which is really the worst thing, is that if you need jumbo frames, it will truncate your packets. You can only do a max of uh, 3,050 byte packets. If you don't need packets bigger than 3,050 bytes and you have standard Linux and Intel cards, you could run this. And you could ignore, say, uh, all Netflix traffic, all YouTube traffic, in individual flows without having to just wholesale block traffic to those destinations. Uh, and yeah, it's just unfortunate that you can't currently use jumbo frames. But part of the reason they're able to do line rate 40 gig performance is because the packets have to fit in individual pages and pages are four kilobytes. So I guess go back a number of years and complain to Intel and tell them to make pages bigger and it would work, but otherwise we're kind of out of luck for now. But otherwise it's probably one of the coolest things. So yeah, you can run bro with AF packet and run this and everything just works. You don't have to modify anything. So unlike PF ring or netmap or DPDK, this is in the kernel. You just need kernel 417, 418, and it will just work. Not a single patch or non-standard uh, add-on. So, and that's really the, the best part of it. Um, so yeah, that is lib flow bypass. And did we get any questions? How does lib flow bypass handle VLANs in Q and Q? Uh, good question, Vlad. Um, you actually have to handle it. Uh, I think I have a comment for VLAN. And it's funny, one thing about this is that you can't actually do loops, so you just do it twice. You see if the packet is of type .1Q and you strip the VLAN tag and then you check again. Uh, because this code is running in the kernel, like it looks like you're writing C code that's just run as a binary, but it's not. It gets turned into that BPF bytecode. So it's very limited on the kinds of things you could do in this. And one of them is you can't do for loops, but you can do something twice. So, all right, I think that was the only question. Any, any other questions? I know I covered a lot of stuff. Question? Hi. So my, you were talking about the tables. Uh, are they static or are they d dynamically loaded? Uh, do you mean the size? I mean, I mean, if you preload the list of uh, five tuples. Or, uh, sorry. Five oh, tuples, I see. Or... Yeah. So the the cool thing you could do with eBPF is bind a kernel map to user space, and then you could modify it from user space. 
So if you did want to preload a number of things, you would just do that at startup. Like, uh, actually, since I can't show the demo, I wonder, can I get a new window with, there we go. The way it works is, and the integration with Bro, is once you have it running, there's just a bypass CLI which calls a function. So you call this with the flow that you don't want to see, and you won't see it. And it just gets loaded into the kernel. And my quick and dirty, super fast implementation for Bro was to just use system to run that existing tool. Uh, ideally, you'd have a BIF using like really the very simple stuff Robin demoed yesterday, really no more complicated than that ROT13 example to just call the library directly instead of going through system. And yeah, the cool thing about the BPF tables is you can do some pretty gigantic tables uh, in the kernel. You're not limited by TCAM space or anything like that. All right, any other questions? Might be done a little early. I don't know, questions? I lost my window. Oh, well, all right, yeah, if there's no more other questions, I guess if you want to know something in really detail, get a hold of me later, and I could give you a more in-depth demo of any one of these things. But I would definitely say uh, to look at the atomic log rotate because it will likely make your cluster run a lot better. So, all right, that's everything. Thank you.